been waiting for has now finally arrived. From knockouts to tap outs. It is all over. Inside the octagon and beyond. Is this not real now? Are we pretending? Well, rich baby, break out the red panties. This is the MMA Report with John Fowler. Unbelievable! Here we go! <laughs> Hello and welcome to the MMA Report. I'm your host, John Pollock. Thank you for tuning in. Coming up on the show today, we're going to be joined by Vitor Belfort, who is heading into UFC 212 on Saturday night from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. He's going to be fighting Nate Marquardt. And the status of Vitor Belfort has very much been a roller coaster. Initially, Vitor Belfort had stated this would be his last fight with the UFC, and it was kind of starting to get pushed as a retirement fight even though Vitor had been stating last fight with the UFC. Well, since that time, Dana White has come out stating, hey, you've got another fight on your contract. And now Vitor is saying that it is not his final fight. We're going to chat with Vitor about many different topics, including what he is looking at beyond fighting in his long-term future. So lots to discuss with one Vitor Belfort uh, coming off a very strange decision when he lost to Kelvin Gastelum back in March, and then that was flipped to a no contest after the marijuana metabolites that were found in Kelvin Gastelum's system. We'll also ask him about that during the chat. Also, as well, we will have Cody Safdick coming on in just a couple of minutes. We're going to run through all of the news from the past week. We'll take a look at Tough this past week. We've got our wild card announcement. I still wonder how much... Uh, People are invested in Tough, even though when you look at the numbers that Tough has been doing this season, uh, last week, very quietly, they had their most watched episode of the season. And I mean, they're they're not doing anywhere close to the spike numbers. But from that two hour premiere back in April that did 288,000 viewers, it's it's somewhat increased. Uh, they did 380,000 last week, which uh, tops what they did uh, back for the second episode of the season, which was their second highest mark at 372. So, I mean, there's, there's a healthy audience for it. I wouldn't say a gigantic amount. And while we're on the ratings front, this past Sunday, the UFC presented a rare Sunday morning slash afternoon card from Stockholm, Sweden. The last time they were in Sweden, they catered all of their broadcast to the North American audience. This time, they presented it for the live event audience in Stockholm at the Ericsson Globe Arena. So we got a 10 a.m. start time on Fight Pass, and then the main card kicked off at 1 p.m. Eastern time, and the numbers were not good. The main card averaged 496,000 viewers, the prelims doing 353, uh, which featured Pedro Munoz and Damien Stasiak in the featured prelim bout, significantly down from what a typical UFC fight night card would do. And since this was such a big discussion the week prior, when Bellator opted to air their event from London on tape delay, I think that this kind of shows the thinking behind this. Because if you were to take this same card from Sweden and air it on tape delay Sunday night, where you didn't have any NBA or NHL competition... There's no question this card does significantly better on tape delay than it did live, even on a Sunday. You look at the Bellator card, a Friday afternoon card on Spike. I I just don't think that you could imagine that there's enough of an audience that has to see that card live that is not going to still watch on tape delay, which many did last week. When you look at the numbers for Bellator, they did 607,000 viewers it peaked at a lot higher than that for the Rory Paul Daly fight. So I think that is, you have to make that argument when you're looking at live versus tape delay because Sunday was an indication that being live doesn't necessarily mean you're going to gain the most amount of eyeballs. And this was a fight that featured the number one versus number two contender at 205 pounds. We'll chat more about the outcome of that fight as well as uh, Volkan Uzdemir and Misha Serkinov coming up with Cody Safdick. Uh, later on the program, we're going to preview UFC 212 that's going down Saturday night. But before we get to Cody, I did want to make mention that this past week was the 11-year anniversary of the passing of Ryan Bennett, who was um, a huge 
contributor to mixed martial arts uh, throughout the 2000s. He was the founder of MMAWeekly.com and did a tremendous job um, at that site with his sound off uh, radio program doing that show alongside with Frank Trigg. Um, they did a lot of work together and he was someone that I got to know uh, during the last few months of his life because Ryan was hired by the Fight Network uh, during the Fight Network's infancy. The Fight Network TV channel, it launched in September of 2005 and Ryan Bennett was brought on board. He was still going to be running MMA Weekly but would kind of be uh, the face of the network. He would be front and center. He was sent down to all of the UFC events covering them on behalf of the Fight Network and someone that uh, I, I got to know uh, quite a bit more during those couple of months uh, before his passing. And uh, it's one of those uh, memories. I mean, this guy, you will not hear a bad word said about Ryan Bennett. He was such a great mentor to many people, just always a positive attitude and someone that was very open to just sharing advice and uh being very helpful, and I was really glad that I got to to know Ryan Bennett throughout those last couple of months, and I will always remember um, the day that we came into the office and everyone was called together and no one knew what was happening, and we're all just like, first of all, our first thought was, man, are is this it? Is you know, we, the channel's been on the air now for since September. This was the end of May. It, it would have been, it would have been June the first that uh, this meeting took place, and it was just days removed from the Matt Hughes Hoist Gracie fight um, that took place, which was a gigantic fight at the time. And I remember hearing stories at the time of uh, Ryan Bennett was at church the next day, and people were asking him about the fight. I mean, this guy was just such a huge fan and supporter of the sport and getting back to this meeting everyone at the fight network was called together and one of the one of the people that that worked there we could hear off into the offices just just crying and then they made the announcement about what had happened uh, with Ryan Bennett and for those that aren't familiar with the story he was driving with his family and he lost control of his car and and Ryan died tragically. His family lived, uh, but it was just a horrific story. And it, of course, you know, you just you don't know what to expect when you're uh, the entire network is called together for this meeting and what the news is going to be. And it just blindsided everybody. And it was just such a such a horrible day and one that I, I still remember very clearly. And that was in 2006. So I want to start off this show just remembering Ryan Bennett. He was, um, you know, right as mixed martial arts was truly exploding. I mean, he was at the forefront, had such a great relationship with so many fighters and his work at MMA Weekly and uh, getting to know this guy uh, certainly left a huge mark on the industry in which he covered. So uh, rest in peace, Ryan Bennett. And now we will uh, kick things off and we're going to welcome in Cody Safdick to go through all of the news from the past week. Uh, can I just give me, a, give me a moment? Can I ask my girlfriend, Mua, comes up to the cage? I love you and thanks for having a kid or baby. I love you with all my heart and you want to marry me? It's a beautiful night, we're looking for something dumb to do. Hey baby, I think I want to marry you. Welcome back to the show, John Pollock with you alongside Cody Safdick of the Fight Network. We have a lot to discuss heading into UFC 212 coming up this Saturday night. Scale of 1 to 10, Cody, I know you're usually on the higher side, but where's your your level of interest for Saturday? I love this main event. Yeah, no, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And even just looking at tape on this main event, I mean, there's so many fights out there, John, where you, you never know what's going to happen. No one ever knows what's going to happen. But there's so many fights out there where you got an idea. You know, I, I think this is going to happen. Holloway versus Aldo, I'm going to say it's the fight that's almost impossible to break down because there's nothing that you can say that would 
make the other person's point of view wrong. I mean, both guys have a lot of merit here. And I look at Jose Aldo, the longtime champion. I don't want to hear about you while he got one punch by Conor McGregor. The fact of the matter is you take out that one moment. You take out those few seconds out of the equation. And this guy's the greatest featherweight of all time. Still, even with the knockout, he's the greatest featherweight of all time. Look at Max Holloway. And I think we live in an era now where you, you, when you're past your prime, it's time for the next generation. That's how it is. This is a night that features the end of Vitor Belfort because, quite frankly, he couldn't hang anymore. And we see a lot of our heroes, the BJ Pens of the world, guys that maybe they can't hang anymore. But that being said, there's always going to be that Frankie Edgar, Yair Rodriguez where it's like, wow, Frankie's just a little too much at this time. And look time. what Aldo did. Like, granted, I mean, he didn't wipe the floor with Frankie. But his last face July, certainly looked like. But dude, that was oh, a decisive yeah. win over truly one of the greatest fighters of all time in Frankie Edgar, and he's done it twice. And to me, the number that is staggering with Jose Aldo... His age. <laughs> he's 30. Yeah. He's only 30, yeah, Cody. Yeah, like, this is yeah. crazy that we look at Jose Aldo as this guy that has just been this longtime veteran and stalwart of that featherweight division, and he's 30 years old, and... I mean, he's been in some battles, but I wouldn't say he's been in that decisive war that you question what what the next uh, number of fights in his career are going to look like. I don't think he's had that level of damage where if he's still fighting at this level in three or four years, that would not stun me. I mean, his speed will go, but he his striking is is something that I feel he will contend very well at. Yeah, yeah. I feel like if you're Jose Aldo, I mean, you've been able to stay at the the highest level of the game for in a division where time passes you by. I mean, you hear Max Holloway say it on the countdown show. He's like, I looked up at this guy when I was 17. I would have wanted to fight him. And it's shocking that he's still here doing it. That in itself is crazy. We talk about, yeah, he's 30. You know what year he had his first pro fight? 2000 and four. He's got long over a decade of pro MMA under his belt. And when, when you talk about it, he's never really had that war in the UFC outside of maybe the Chad Mendes rematch, which was a good, you know, back and forth right. fight. Yeah. Maybe he never really had that 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 big damage performance. But I think the way they train at Nova Union and just being around the game for so long and put you in a room with 30 guys that are your weight class and want it just as bad as you do. That in itself has really led to the fact that Jose Aldo fights something once a year. I mean, even we look how good he looked against Frankie Edgar, but that fight was 11 months ago and mm-hmm. prior to that I mean he's just even the first time he fought Frank he was coming off a year long layoff now mind you he looks good I guess coming off year long layoffs but at some point you got to realize that he's not competing as much as possible because he is damaged because he is you know getting up there in age and so I look at the significant strike numbers whereas Jose Aldo all of his fights for the most part are going 25 minutes and he's able to strike about 80 he's about sorry to able to land about 80 significant strikes in a 25-minute period, whereas Max Holloway lands over 100 strikes in a 15-minute period. The guy's all punch output. He's young. He's energetic. He pushes the pace. And Jose Aldo, I mean, what's that, what's that long-occurring thing that everyone always said about him? Best guy in the world. Oh, toughest guy in the world. You know, maybe gas tanks a tad bit of an issue. I mean, he tends to fade out in rounds four and five. I mean, you look at some big fights in his career, uh, Mark Hominick winning the fifth round against him, Ricardo yep. Lamas winning the fifth round against him, even some of those other fights where, you know, like, I think a Kenny Florian won something like the fourth round against him. You might be able to get this guy late and against Max Holloway, five hard rounds at a fast pace. Maybe that's the key. Oh, wait, it's in Brazil. So many variables to this card that you're talking, am I excited for? I'm very excited for it, especially this main event because... There's so many different angles that you can look at this fight at, and I think it's going to be a uh, terrific outing. Uh, We'll talk a bit more about UFC 212, but just circling back to last weekend in Sweden, certainly most of the focus was on the two light heavyweight fights, and that's a division that has kind of been simmering for some time now, and it feels like this is the most momentum this division has had in years. Uh, First of all, uh, Volkan Uzdemir. (sighs) I got to eat some crow on that one. 28 seconds. I think a lot of people are. I think many people assume that Misha Serkinov would, would... would run through Volkan Uzdemir. Not the case. 28 seconds where Volkan Uzdemir wins this fight. And you and I were speaking earlier this week that it's one of those wins where I don't know if you come out of this fight with too many questions answered regarding Uzdemir because it's one of those fights that 28 seconds, it looks so impressive that at times you can overvalue a fighter in their next performance based off of a very tiny sample size, albeit against a tremendous contender in, in Misha Serkinov. But 
credit to Uzdemir, I, I think Jimmy Manawa, I think the same questions will go into that fight about how this guy is, is going to fare. Yeah, exactly. I mean, on one case, people always throw out that term lucky punch, but you can't, it's so hard to gauge somebody off what they do in 28 seconds. I mean, as he, you mentioned, he ate some shots too in order to right, land that shots. counter. Listen, I got as many questions as I did before about Uzdemir, but I also got a lot of questions about Misha now. And I think that's the thing. I mean, was it simply, oh, I slipped on a banana peel and got caught? Or was it this guy can't take a shot at the highest level? I mean, we're just, we're never going to know. I, I really, in my heart of hearts, I truly believe that this will be like an, a Damian Maya, Nate Marquardt moment where he realizes, I'm a jiu-jitsu guy. I can strike. No doubt. But I have to use those strikes to set up my takedown so I can get the fight to where I want. If I'm just going to rush in there and throw punches against Volkan and Uzdemir, I watch that replay. God, I'd love to just say 100 times, but at least 50 times. And in Maybe full he'll fight Gokan Saki. Misha Serkinov, Gokan Saki. No, no. Here's, here's my real dilemma here, okay? Volkan and Uzdemir is ranked five or higher in the division. And what if he fought Gokan Saki right now? Gokan Saki would absolutely thrash him in a stand-up match. Okay, well, it's MMA. It's not a stand-up match. Does anybody know that Volkan Uzdemir is going to take down Gokan Saki? So how could a guy that's 0-1... Wait, wait, wait. Gokan Saki said on the record this week he, he's never going to be taken down. So just eliminate that theory. You know what? I once heard King Mo go on record saying, I'm having trouble getting down James Tony, And then James Tony went on record saying, he can't take me down at all. <laughs> so, I mean, take it for what it's worth. I, I love Gokan Saki. I love the fact that I figured he'd go to Bellator if he was going to fight in MMA at this stage in his career. But, I mean, yeah, will it end up like a Joe Schilling situation where he's getting knocked out? I don't think so. I think he goes out there. And if you're Volkan Uzdemir and you want to stand with him, I think you're in a lot of trouble. I think there's certain other guys in the division that if they stand with him, they're in a lot of trouble. But the guys that are willing to take him down, the Corey Andersons of the world, if they can just get that takedown on him, I can't imagine he has anything. But circling back to Uzdemir and Shurkinov, man, I mean, I have so many questions that are now left unanswered but hey big win for Vulcan and now that he's going to be fighting Jimmy Manoa July 29th uh where where is Alexander Gustafson now in the equation this in my opinion was the best performance of his career yeah this absolutely greatly surpassed the John Jones outing that it, a lot of people had just hung his hat on for that performance in 2013 this was such a different Alexander Gustafson in this fight and the punishment that Glover Teixeira took was ungodly. I mean, this guy's about to turn 38 and this was the kind of fight that you look at as a career altering. This was... It, that finish will be burned in my mind for years, Cody. Yeah, yeah. I, I think if you're Glover Teixeira at this point, that's the person who's going to have to go back to the board and really think to themselves, it, it, what, am I, what do I do next at this point? But if you're Alexander Gustafsson, huge win. But clearly the UFC is not looking at you for the next guy. They're looking at Jimmy Manuel. Jimmy Manuel is a guy that the fans want to see get his crack at the, at the title right now just because, you know, exciting style, that big power. He's able to go out there and sell the fight. And he's a new, fresh challenger if you're Daniel Cormier. So it's like, okay, I'm going to go and I'm going to get this match with Jimmy Manuel, but we still got to sell Jimmy Manuel a little bit here. So when Volkan Uzdemir walks out of the fight unscathed, you know what? Volkan's he, the spoiler, man. <laughs> Volkan's the spoiler, absolutely. But if if people were looking, people were laughing coming into this fight, myself being those people, but thinking this guy's not even a top 15 light heavyweight, let alone rank number seven. I mean, h- how could he possibly be ranked that high in the UFC? Misha is going to kill him. But you win one fight, which takes 28 seconds. And now all of a sudden, oh, he's definitely a top five guy. Oh, definitely. I like Volkan. So if you're Jimmy Manuel, you're going to get some credibility off going out there and starching Volkan. Ken Uzdemir, which take out the Misha Cherkinov fight, take it out of the equation, right? Jimmy Manuel versus Volkan Uzdemir doesn't really make any sense, right? It's the same thing with Misha versus Volkan Uzdemir. It didn't make any sense. Now, oh, well, he just knocked out Misha. It makes sense. You can sell it. So let him go out there. And if he smashes Volkan Uzdemir in spectacular fashion, he's the next guy for the title shot. If you're Alexander Gustafsson, you've already beat Jimmy Manoa. So he's the fresh face that's going to get the next shot. You got to sit. I see it's him being him versus OSP as being a stay busy fight until he can open up the doors to get another title shot. I mean, there's no doubt that people would like to see him maybe fight John Jones again. There's no doubt that people might like to see him fight Daniel Cormier again, which was a good fight, but it's not going to happen right now. He's going to be at least one more fight away, and I think OSP would be the logical guy there. Yeah, I'm curious to see what kind of uh, – it's ultimately going to come down to where where everything is figured the day after UFC 214. I could certainly see if John Jones is your champion that that's, that's the automatic fight to make because they're – I don't know if John Jones and Jimmy Manoa is necessarily the direction they go 
It could be. I think uh, I think it's a fine fight, especially if there's questions about John Jones and where his chin's at. Like, I mean, why do people want to see Anthony Johnson versus John Jones, right? Everybody knows, especially stylistically, well, John Jones is just too rangy. He'll take him down and he'll control him on the ground. That's Anthony Johnson's kryptonite. But still, you're thinking, well, he's got tremendous power. And, you know, John Jones is a guy that has mental lapses during the fight and get tends to get dragged into these brawls at times. Why can't a guy like Anthony Johnson knock him out? Well, if Anthony Johnson's on the sideline, which we could get back into that as well, because I think he's coming back for sure. Sure. But that allows the guy like Jimmy Manua to now be the division's power puncher. And there's always going to be that intrigue with the power puncher because this is MMA. It only takes one punch. And Jimmy Manua has the best one at 205 pounds right now. So there is some intrigue. But I do believe John Jones versus Gustafson 2 sells far beyond that. You are when, right. when was the last time we had a discussion like this at 205 pounds where you have all these interesting options all of a sudden? And not, not to say this is the most thriving division in the UFC, but from what used to be the the golden division of the UFC as they were rising throughout the 2000s. I mean, this thing outside of John Jones, who you could really claim as the greatest fighter in the sport, it was what was beyond that and and trying to find intrigue in this division. And I think now you're starting to see a lot of parts come into place and and where things will be. That July 29th card, that's really fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. You're building up the division. I've always been a, a big advocate of this, is if the division gets blown out and the champion takes time off, then all of a sudden it's going to grow up again because now there's going to be new storylines. There's going to be fresh challengers. You're going to allow other guys to work their way up. A lot of times when the division gets boring, a Demetrius Johnson, for example, there's no number two contender. You know when it's champion against number two there's no ray borg is ray borg really the number two guy or and then you got benavidez out there and you got Sahudo out there and you got good challengers that are all building their way up but he's he he's smacked everybody he's beaten everybody there's really no point there you let go of kyoji horiguchi because it's like quite frankly i can't move this guy up fast enough he can't beat demetrius johnson right now and i'm not going to let him just you know toil away with the rest of the division until uh one guy decides to eventually leave but if demetrius johnson would just go up to 35 or retired whatever the case i hope he doesn't retire and i don't think he needs to go to 35 but i'm just saying take him out of the equation that division bolsters up you got Sahudo taking on benavidez for the title let's say well oh benavidez won yeah but Sahudo should have won that and i got all these other guys coming up the ranks and i got all the other challengers that are building and ray borg well he's still knocking on the door now only it's a lot more intriguing now that ray borg's gonna take on this other guy like it builds it up. Will Brooks killed the Bellator lightweight division. It was dead. And then he left. And now Chandler, who couldn't beat Will Brooks, is now able to fight the other guys. And I, I know he's got a dubious fight coming up. But beyond that, yeah, the division is able to just get new fresh challengers and grow up. So I, I very much look at 205 with the absence of John Jones. Everybody knew he was the best. So take him out of the equation. Now you have some other guys building up. Now you put John Jones back in, but there's question marks. Well, is he still a drug addict? Is he still unfocused? How has his body matured in that time that he's been away? Has his prime left him? Was he ever that good? Which, by the way, answer is yes. All these questions will just pop up in people's minds, and then that makes it more interesting to the casual fan. And also, you throw out the, the wild card of... Looking at several middleweights that are eyeing 205 pounds, Chris Weidman has talked about it. We certainly know Gegard Mousasi, if he is able to resign with the UFC, is one that could go there. You pluck out one of those middleweights and insert it, and suddenly, man, this division gets really interesting Mm -hmm. um, with with some of the names there. Uh, Speaking about Demetrius Johnson, uh, Dana White. Uh, did one of his appearances on the Unfiltered podcast this week uh, with Matt Sarah and Ray Longo and called it insanity that Demetrius Johnson doesn't want to fight TJ Dillashaw. And just he can't understand. He just cannot understand why he would not want to do this. And, you know, they're talking about the fact that, man, it would be such a bigger fight if TJ Dillashaw fought Demetrius Johnson than Ray Borg. First of all, if it ends up that you have to go to this Ray Borg fight, you have the president of the company that's coming out saying this is largely a joke, <laughs> an insignificant fight, which, listen, on pay-per-view, that's not going to do great business. But you know what? Demetrius Johnson and TJ Dillashaw, is that doing 200,000 buys? Yeah. I don't know. No, no, not at all. And I just think uh, when I don't think of, it's going to beat Aldo and Holloway this weekend. But there's no denying that him versus TJ Dillashaw would be the bigger fight. What I don't get is that I don't think he's getting compensated anymore for taking on TJ Dillashaw. And it's a quick turnaround in the sense that, oh, just get ready to take on TJ Dillashaw as opposed to Ray Borg. I don't know that you want to put yourself in that situation. You're about to break a longstanding record if you're Demetrius Johnson. You're a Hall of Famer. Your name is going to be enshrined in the history books. Who do you got to prove anything to? So just taking a fight against TJ Dillashaw because Dana White thinks it's the better fight to take, you don't owe him anything. So in many ways, completely agree. I, I, I'm just I, surprised that they're going so far in on this fight when 
a fight that's bigger than both of those fights we've mentioned is the Cody Garbrandt TJ Dillashaw fight. Not a 400, 500,000 buy kind of fight, but still to me bigger than those two flyweight options. And you're willing to risk that for this card in Seattle. Yeah, yeah. That I, I just don't think the. The juice is worth the squeeze on this one yeah. and and jeopardizing the fight that you've put a whole season of tough into. And what, TJ goes down the flyweight, he wins that title. What do we do about the Garbrandt fight? Is that just lost? Lost. Yeah. Well, there's too many variables. That's exactly it. TJ Dillashaw, also just the whole, con- like, the, the premise of he's just going to drop down to 125 pounds. I mean, that's got to be a task in its own. Is he getting compensated it's more? It's June 1st. Like, it's, if he's fighting August 19th, it's a, that's, it's a quick turn. He better know right now that I'm making this cut uh, uh, to a weight I've never wrestled at, much no. less fought at. Yeah. And also, I'm the former 135-pound champ. I have a guaranteed title shot at 135 pounds, but the guy got hurt I'll just take a shot at 125. No, man. Why would you do that? Especially considering if you lose, are you just going to go up from a failed challenge at 125 back to 135? No. If you win, you're the champ at 125. Does that mean that he fights Ray Borg next? No. It probably means he fights Demetrius Johnson again next because the longstanding champion is going to have a second crack or a rematch clause, whatever the case may be. I just don't think it makes a whole lot of sense to put TJ Dillashaw down. And... I like the fight with Cody Garbrandt. I'm one of the very few people I'm sure that's invested in this season of Tough, but I feel like, yeah, there's an emotion going there, and uh, I'm emotionally invested into it. I want to see someone beat the other guy up. This is good guy versus bad guy, you know what I mean? you got Cody Garbrandt. You put comes so off much awful. into this. Now, listen, I know this is sometimes what will simplify things, but I think at times you do have to take a step back and look at a bigger picture and that – Listen, the day-to-day, negotiating with fighters, matchmaking, I don't wish that upon anyone. Cody, if you ever become the UFC matchmaker, congratulations, but I will not envy your job. But uh, when you just look at how one move can affect so much else, it's yeah. to me, this Demetrius Johnson fight, it's going to do what it's going to do in Seattle. Okay, so fair. So I got actually two points to that, right? One, let's look at that if I was a UFC matchmaker. And just, I, I've matchmade obviously in the past already. So I have that like idea of sometimes you're in a situation, John, where you can't find anybody to fight the guy you're looking to promote. And in this case, he's our 125 pound champ, Demetrius Johnson. He's fighting at home in Seattle. We want to sell this guy, but we know, well, who do we got here, guys? We don't got anybody. Well, we're going to put Ray Borg in there. And then you put it on the forums and it's a joke. People are laughing at it. This guy I just smashed Wilson Hayes and you expect us to buy a fight with him versus Ray Borg a young kid who let alone can't even make 125 pounds by the way and if he does he's gonna struggle I shouldn't say he can't I, I was make talking it, about he him has on the, made it but he's a big guy I was talking about Ray Borg on on the law the other night and then a guy commented to me asking if I was talking about the Boston Bruins player <laughs> So, I mean, that, that is the awareness level of Ray Borg to some. There's very little awareness. Even if you look at that last fight, I believe he fought Formiga. It's like that's a cutthroat fight where it's like he loses one of the rounds. It's 1-1 heading into the third, and he's got to you know use that second gear. It's just it's not a sellable fight. So if I'm the UFC and I'm trying to find someone to fight him at 125, this is truthfully honest here. If someone at 135, a guy like TJ Dillashaw, told me, Cody, I can make 125 and I'll take that fight. That is a saving grace. I'm over the moon ecstatic. I'm almost, dude, you're willing to do that? You're a big name guy. You're willing to drop down on short notice and help me out? Oh my God. TJ, you're my guy. I'm putting that fight together. You call Demetrius and he's like, no. Whoa, man, that sucks because now you're just back to square one, right? But let me, let me ask you this personally. You talk about the fact that it doesn't sell a whole lot, and I, I do agree with that. You put TJ Dillashaw versus Demetrius Johnson on pay-per-view, what's it doing? 200,000? If you put Demetrius Johnson versus Ray Borg on pay-per-view, you know what Way that's less. doing? Way less. But let's just say if you're the UFC and you're looking at best-case scenarios, what's the best-case scenario that we could get out of this? Okay, the best-case scenario is TJ Dillashaw goes down to 125 right now, and he defeats Demetrius Johnson, okay? He's the new champion. Cody Garbrandt comes from back from injury. He takes on Dominic Cruz in a rematch. Match. Still a good storyline there. We can still sell it. He beats Cruz the second time. We put Dillashaw versus, versus Garbrandt together. 125-pound champ against 135-pound champ. The rivalry is always going to be there. It's going to give them more time to talk. It's going to give them more time to get that building up. And now you've got two champions in two separate weight classes meeting each other in what is essentially a grudge match. Maybe that can sell 500000 Not likely. But give it a great supporting cast. We see him punk on the card. And it could sell something. But I'm saying that is a big fight. Anything that involves TJ Dillashaw on his own or Cody Garbrandt on his own or Demetrius Johnson on his own is not a big fight. So if you can combine those elements and you can at least 
bring up, I know we say this all the time and it sounds like fake news, but money fight, you know, essentially that's what the organization is looking to build towards. You know, the ideal scenario, and I mean, financially, it's probably not the ideal scenario for the UFC is that if we don't have a card for August 19th, there's not a need to run a pay-per-view on that date. If I really want to set this up, I would pair Demetrius Johnson's next title defense on the same card as Garbrandt and Dillashaw and schedule it for when Garbrandt is healthy in September, perhaps. Yeah. Maybe but now you, you scrap your date to Seattle because you want they want Demetrius Johnson in the Seattle card. Can do, still do it in Seattle. Saying. Do it a month later. August is not <laughs> Seattle month. It could be September. It might be the only month where it doesn't rain there, John. I don't know. I'm just you kidding. have a great but story no, I, I you, in Demetrius as the hometown guy going for the story. Yep. You also have a big grudge. That That's a decent, serviceable pay-per-view for the UFC. And coming out of it, you could really start that discussion about either Dillashaw or Garbrandt then fighting Demetrius Johnson in their next fight. Not the perfect scenario, but to me, it's better than this where we're coming out and we're so adamant against a fight that still could happen with Ray Borg. And then you've got to sell this guy against the sound bites of your president stating, well, you know, yeah, it's Ray Borg. <laughs> yeah, but like, like you said, well, uh, the winner of Garbrandt versus Dillashaw will fight Demetrius Johnson. It's like, yeah, but if Demetrius Johnson fights TJ, TJ will go to 25. But he fights Cody, Cody's not going to 25. He's staying at 35. So it's just like th- there's so many variables. There's so many angles. I mean, everyone's not – no one's ducking each other. No one's dodging each other. But they want to be properly compensated for the biggest fights pro- uh, possible. And that's what I think it comes down to, Demetrius. Yeah, I'll fight TJ. I'll fight TJ all day. Give me proper camp. Give me something that's going to be worth it to me. I'm sure he's the less, least paid champion in the UFC, certainly amongst the least paid champions in the UFC. I'm sure women's 145 pounds is not bringing huge riches right now. But you get what I'm saying. I think if you're Demetrius Johnson, be smart about it. There are angles, but it's just like anything. It's going to take a lot of negotiating and working together. I'm sure they'll figure it out, though. You read my mind on the next topic, and that is the women's 145-pound division, which I Dead. I use air quotes when I say division. <laughs> what what happens with this weight class? For those that are not uh, aware, uh, Brian Butler, who's the manager for Jermaine Durandamy, spoke to MMAfighting.com this week, stating they have no desire to fight Chris Cyborg based on her past uh, drug test issues and that they are not looking at that fight now also dana white has stated chris cyborg will fight on that july 29th card opponent to be announced yeah no it makes absolute zero sense and, and i am not the kind of guy to say well i told you so but i said this is exactly what's going to happen when they announce this fight holly holm agreed to fight cyborg holly holm said she would take the fight with cyborg i'm sure her management didn't want her to do that but she talked about it and even said maybe a catch weight of 140 which we know cyborg can't make but she was open to the idea so they devised this great plan we're going to put holly holm a 135 pound fighter in there against another 135 pound fighter jermaine durandamy who's been sitting on the sidelines for a little while now and Holly Holm is going to be a big favorite over her. And once Holm wins, we've got Holm as our 145-pound champ. She's the girl that beat Rousey. She's got great name behind her. She's got good reputation. She'll be the champ. I'm, I'm thinking they're looking past Jermaine Durand to me. Holm will be the champ, and we'll bring Cyborg in. She'll fight for the 145-pound title, and now we're launched and we're going. I said to everybody, I said, here's the thing. I thought Holm was going to win too, by the way. I said, they're both 135ers, so the issue is that both of them are going to look to go back down to 135. Even if you win the title and they offer you the Cyborg fight, you don't have to take it. Holm probably would have, if they, especially if they g- gave her a good monetary value and made it worth her while. 100% she would have taken it. But there's no way Jermaine Durand was going to take that fight. And you just got that impression. And, and right away, it's just like, oh, are you going to rematch home? No. Are you going to fight Cyborg? No. No interest, man. So she's going back down to 35. Holm has already gone back down to 135. And the only other conceivable challenger, Megan Anderson, just got booked in an Invicta fight. So she's not even the option you're going with. So now you're scratching your head thinking, every time I see Cyborg fight, it's, it, you know what I mean? It's like just a non-competitor it's a non-competition fight it's like i haven't seen her in anything remotely interesting maybe the leslie smith fight could have been somewhat interesting but no you see her absolutely smoke her and then you're looking at you know lena landsberg and does anybody want to see that type of fight no john no they don't they'd like to see her fight a girl like holly holm or maybe megan anderson you can sell that but taking all those options off the table having cyborg who's now apparently getting charged from angela mangania and then just saying, yeah, no, she'll come back, she'll fight on this card, and she'll likely get a shot at the 145-pound title. It's a joke. It's a farce. And, and when we talk about a world where there's so many weight classes and so many titles and things become irrelevant, once again, this is another situation where are you going to strip Jermaine Durand to me or are you just going to say, 
oh, this is the vacant title or this is the interim title. Oh, like, don't, don't even suggest an interim title. Yeah, there will be more titles than women in this division. There actually is, okay? It's, <laughs> it's absolutely ridiculous. I can't even fathom it. And while this entire process is going on, you're now introdu- introducing the 125-pound women's division. So, I mean, we talk about a cluster and this is very much one of them. This is one of the most disastrous weight, cl- weight class introductions in UFC history. It has For to be sure. the worst. For sure. Next to the time they scrapped 155 because of the draw. After yeah. Pan and Uno. Yeah. That, that, this is the most disastrous outcome possible. It's, uh, it, it really is a mess. Uh, let's do our tough review for this past uh, week. We had uh, Joe Stevenson, our season two winner, uh, drop a decision to Justin Edwards, but then uh, gets new life as one of the wild card selections against Hader Hassan. <laughs> yeah. Julian Lane, uh, uh, not medically cleared to And Medi Bagdad. Back. The two guys I thought would come back, both of them. Hey, just so you know, Julian Lane, Medi Bagdad out. Oh, now who do you want? How, like, how is it. Joe Stevenson medically cleared to fight? Well, I that, mean, they that made was a Cody big, Garbrandt's question. Listen, that was the big uh, theme at the end was Garbrandt just on Dillashaw about how can you let your fighter come back this quickly after all the damage he took. Uh, t- Garbrandt's team, not wrong. No, no. Hey, listen, they're not wrong. I mean, that is uh, a worry, especially when you're Joe Stevenson, you're 34. You're not, listen, you want to talk about a guy that got damaged up in a small period of time, Hader Hassan. This guy was forced to go through the absolute ringer on tough American top team versus the Black Zillions. But if, if you're, you know, if you're game, you're able to fight, you want to compete, you're healthy, then you're going to get in there. Six days, that is a quick turnaround. Joe Stevenson didn't fight three rounds. He only fought two rounds. And as such, I, I know what they're saying, like, yeah, he got damaged in there, but he didn't get dropped. He got hit with some co- solid clean shots. But at no point when they were talking to him afterwards did he seem like he was completely messed up. I, I found it a little tad bit shocking that as soon as he lost, he went to the dressing room and he was just like, well, time to gear up for the wild card spot. He wanted to fight. Joe Stevenson's the guy that's been fighting for over a decade. Joe Stevenson, Joe Stevenson is a guy that's got 40 professional fights, 50 professional fights. A six-day turnaround, that's not going to phase a guy like this. But yeah, a part of me does worry. The best soundbite out of that whole thing, I thought, though, is Cody Garbrandt's like, how could you do that? How could you do that? You know, like, you got to you gotta worry about him and his health. And they're walking away, and then, and then Cody Garbrandt's like, or uh, uh, TJ Dillashaw's like, uh, yeah, but you know, he's, he's, got, he's got a family. And then Garbrandt's like, oh, you're, you're looking at it like that. Yeah. No, no, you're right. You're right. Yeah. I respect it's that. Because like, it's like, dude, yeah, he's 34. It's tough redemption. This is redemption, man. This guy's actually shockingly, he was, he, he I think he's three months y- older than Hader Hassan. And he's the same age as, uh, as Justin Edwards, who he fought. Yep. Yet he's been around since tough two. He's clearly not a welterweight. This is his last shot. The guy... Let him have a shot here. And I think Garbrandt got that. Yeah, he's right. What are we going to do? Put Eddie Gordon back in? Eddie Gordon has had his shot, and he'll still have his shot. This is really the last shot for Joe Stevenson. And then he kind of understood it a little bit more. I don't think I'd put Joe Stevenson in there only because this is a nightmare matchup. No, that's just it's me. kind of, you know, for, for the Garbrandt side of things, I mean, this is, you know, you go from an option where it would be both of your fighters and guaranteed one of them is going to at least move on. Or could, to- they, have, or could they have switched up the bracket? Could he have not maybe gone, listen, bring back two of my guys and then split them. Let two of his guys fight two of my guys. Or would they have said, no, the two wild cards got to fight each other? I think that's how it was set up, that the two wild cards would, would face off with one another. I guess this is just where the season, if you overthink it too much, kind of falls apart. That To what end for Joe Stevenson? I mean, to go on this Cinderella run and at the end of it, you have a... Uh, a new UFC contract at the end of things. It's just, there's such a disparity here that, uh, granted, I don't think anyone believes that's going to be an option for Joe Stevenson. Yeah, fair, but I, I also feel like if you're Joe Stevenson, there could have been the the option of, if I can just get a UFC contract out of it, I don't have to compete at 170 pounds anymore. I can go back to a more comfortable weight class of 155. Y- you know what? You know who would love to fight Joe Stevenson? Everyone in the lightweight division? Mickey Gall. Oh boy, you're right. <laughs> I just mean, he could have won a I, I can't even name you a guy at the top of my head that I'd be comfortable with Joe Stevenson beating in the lightweight or the featherweight division. The guy is undersized for the weight class. He did not look in particularly good shape in this fight. The first round, I scored for Justin Edwards, but I thought Joe Stevenson had a good round. It was a good round. He was wearing on Edwards, but that second round— Had that round, one guillotine? I mean, the two guillotines he got out of, I was worried about, but Joe Stevenson's had a black belt since 2006, I'm pretty sure, so getting him in a guillotine choke would have been a, a, hell, of a, a hell of a you know feather in your cap. 
I just I, I feel bad because this makes you feel old. This really shows like you the mortality of a fighter where you're like, man, I remember Joe Stevenson on Tough Two. I remember Joe Daddy with the bleach blonde hair having that guillotine choke. And then you just see him, you know, 10 years later and the lengthy losing streak in which he ended his UFC career and still leaves a sour taste. Him. Watching Mac Danzig wreck this guy with that KO back then was like Joe Stevenson's probably at the end of the road but like we're, we're coming about, up on a decade since the pen fight yeah and this is what this is what I do find shocking is that we think about how old this guy is but he's only 34 so when you say the thing with Aldo he's only 30 yeah they're actually young guys Joe Riggs we talked about him last week they're actually young guys but the amount of of wear and tear. So I just spoke to Rafael Lovato and he's turning he's turning 34 this month. But I talked to him. I said, yo, listen, Damian Maia is turning 40 this year and Jacques Ray Souza is turning 38. Leo Santos is turning 38. The one championship light heavyweight champ mm-hmm. right now is uh, Hodger Gracie. I think he's turning 36 this year. Why is it that jiu-jitsu practitioners can fight later on? Because we're not taking the same wear and tear. Not Joe Stevenson, every week. Joe Stevenson took the wear and tear. And to that point, to tie you back to the, how we started this entire conversation about Aldo, Max Holloway, Aldo's taken the damage. And is this a passing of the torch moment? It certainly could be. But Joe Stevenson's seen better days. And yeah, the best case scenario, he gets a UFC contract. And then what? Gets bounced after a couple losses. I mean, I was happy he was on this Kingdom show as a stunt coordinator, and I thought maybe that would be where his. Uh, I think he still owns Cobra Kai Jiu Jitsu as well in Las Vegas. Mm-hmm. So he's got he's got avenues for money, but you know, fight is gonna fight is gonna fight. And he's a competitive guy. Uh, before we wrap things up here, I'm gonna throw out some names. We only got a few this week, and you're just gonna let us know winner or loser this oh. past week. Starting with Glover Teixeira. Loser, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Tough, not not only the fight him. itself, but like career-wise, when you look at everything he's been through, you look at – he had been stopped, what, one other time against like Ed Herman back in 2002, but he had a granite chin. Anthony Johnson, you give him a pass. That knockout, oh, devastating. That uppercut, oof. But you know what? Hey, it's Anthony Johnson. You, you suffer a very similar knockout, and that's the uppercut again. It had been landing all fight. He's 38 years old now. That's end of the road. So, like, loser, 100%. That, that, that's a double whammy, which hurts me because, you know, I do like Glover. Volkan Uzdemir. Huge winner. Huge yeah, winner. Definitely yeah, stock, winner. If his stock was already too high for what it was at, uh, go. But, but I know I probably say this too much. If I'm talking to my financial advisor, George St. Pierre, right now, sell, sell, sell because you're selling high. Volkan Uzdemir's stocks ain't going any higher than this, man. I mean, yeah, he beat Misha. That was huge. He was overachieving after the OSP win, which was a close fight anyways. His stock is as high as it could possibly be. So good for him for being like, give me Jimmy Manoa. And the US, it was like, okay, here's Jimmy Manoa. Let's hey, do given, it. Given how complicated the matchmaking has been this year and dealing with fighters, I was actually stunned at how fast this Manoa Uzdemir fight came together. They said they wanted to make this fight, and a few days later, it was announced. We, we talk about it all the time. You have a moment to grab the mic and be like, yeah, this is actually who I'd like to fight next. And there's a good probability that they're like, yeah, does that work for you? The guy that got called out almost never turns it down. Oh, he wants to go. Let's go unless you're a champ. And everyone's calling you out. But yeah, no, this makes total sense to me. And I think, uh, yeah, Volcan who's your big winner on the weekend. Winner or loser, Joe Stevenson. Loser. Wow, yes. Well, I don't mean to call Joe a loser. Guy's a Hall of Famer. But this is a bad situation, man. This is a bad situation. And final one, Roy Nelson, who we did not discuss. Yeah, winner, because Roy Nelson's in his 40s. Roy Nelson has really gone as far as he could in the UFC and never had a good UFC contract to begin with. But when you think about Roy Nelson back before the Reebok deal came in, and he has a Pizza Pizza sponsorship, and he's got you know a trucking company is behind him, and oh, big country. Guys get behind him. And if I'm Roy Nelson, I'm like... You know, I get a little older, getting a little slower. You know, what are my options here? Well, the winningest heavyweight in Bellator history is Chike Congo. <laughs> oh, sign me up. Big country's coming to Bellator. I think this is a fantastic move for him and uh, big winner, big country. And uh, as we finish things up, just get, uh, circling back to UFC 212, we do have Vitor Belfort coming up next. And this has been kind of weird because he initially stated this is my last UFC fight. Now it's being disputed by the UFC that he has one more fight remaining on his deal. I'm going to ask Vitor a bit about, you know, how he's approaching this fight, if it in fact will be. And I mean, what, where do you see the future of Vitor Belfort? Because now it looks like he has at least another fight in the UFC. You know what? I was thinking about this the other day, actually. And I could be wrong in this. You might be able to check it, but Vitor Bel- Belfort's record right now is 28 and 14. Or is it 26 and 13? 28 and 14, right? His record is 25 and 13 with one no contest. 25, 13 with, Which with would no be contest. the Kelvin fight. 
Yeah, yeah, okay. Oh, nah, I guess that makes sense. Vitor Belfort, yeah, he doesn't have anything to prove right now, but he he's still got the fight on his contract, and he's mentioned that this is going to be the end, but for whatever reason, I just I didn't really believe it when I heard it. I thought to myself, if he goes out there and he starts Nate Marquardt, he's going to stick around for something else. So... I almost see this as the UFC is asking him to retire. They've probably seen his last string of performances, and they've asked him, hey, could you call it the day here? We'll give you Nate Marquardt. That'll be the end of it. But you don't want this guy signing with Bellator, so you want to remain a fight on his deal. Don't let him run his deal out, because there's no question the idea of fighting in Ryzen, where they don't give a crap what you put in your body, or the idea of simply going to Bellator and taking you know a no, fun fight. This so guy screams Bellator. Yeah, yeah. He is earmarked for it. But, I mean, but if you... Uh, I, I don't want to... <laughs> Don't let him run his contract. I don't want to steal my own thunder here in the interview, but you'll hear – like this guy clearly has a desire to very much become an executive with the UFC or even more so to be more of a liaison between the fighters and the executives because he clearly sees a big gulf between the two at the moment, which unquestionably there is at the moment. So it seems like he has a lot of – Ideas. He is not close to fighting in the future. I think he will fight again beyond Saturday. But it seems that he definitely wants to be keeping his options open. And I don't think he's looking at, you know, necessarily a departure from the UFC if the job offer is there. Yeah, I would look at it, though. If you're Vitor Belfort, it seems like a great idea. Yeah, you know what? When I retire, I'm a former champion. I'm a Hall of Famer. I'm a legend. The UFC will float me a job. And they floated a lot of guys' jobs, guys that had high stature names, the Chuck Liddell's, the Forrest Griffins. Vitor Belfort might have been able to fit in that category. But having the new ownership come in, are they looking to hire a fighter liaison between Brazilian fighters and American fighters or, or the American company executives? Just because, I don't know, they probably got a guy who's a business guy who's taken these courses, so that's specifically his job. But let's say they would even take Vitor Belfort. Doesn't Big Nog already have pretty much the same job? How many of these old Brazilian, when Anderson Silva retires and he wants a job as a as an ambassador between Brazil and America? Like, I don't know. At some point, you're going to think to yourselves, we can't give jobs to all these guys. No, and as we learned with the cuts, I mean, those are cuts, expendable jobs. Those are all expendable jobs. I mean, we don't, we can't give a guy a favor and Big Nog's probably the better guy for the job. And, and realistically, how much of a farce would it be if, you know, Vitor Belfort is your policy guy or something like that? If all jokes aside, I, I, I hope he lands on his feet. I hope whatever he ends up doing beyond fighting is good to him. But I'm noticing with a lot of these guys, you know, the Matt Hughes, even Anthony Johnson. Anthony Johnson's not an old guy, but take, for example, that you're now on the sidelines. He's what, I think 33 years old. And you think, well, I got this new business going. And all of a sudden it dawns on you, this business is not taken off as fast as I would have liked. And surely, if you know, I, I'm sure it's public news, but he's getting into the marijuana industry. This is not just like, it's free money. We're printing money. Like the amount of like government loopholes you'd have to jump and, and and red tape. I mean, I don't think it's a conceivable, a conceivably a good idea for somebody. But it's gonna you're gonna have to rack up hundreds of thousand dollars in lawyer fee just so you could possibly get a permit to do this. And at that point, possibly get the money, assuming that the government just doesn't privatize this and you know give it to the uh, the LCBO or whatever the case is. I'm getting too far of myself. But if you're Anthony Johnson, you're just sitting at home, you're watching some TV, and Alexander Gustafson beats Glover, and he looks good but i could beat this guy still and you know i'm really worried about that misha guy because i even went on record to say this guy's a gangster and i don't like his ground game one bit oh, dude he just got smashed by volcan and i train with volcan at the black zillions and i know i smash him too ah, i got a couple fights left in me you know it's always so much more appealing to take one more fight and get paid when you're sitting on the sidelines thinking i could use an extra hundred grand so vitor is no different than any other guy that's ever fought like the only guy that's ever retired early and like stuck with it was uh, Genki Sudo and Nick Thompson, right? Outside of that, guys come back. Well, I mentioned it. Uh, Vitor Belfort, he will be in action this Saturday night, part of UFC 212 against Nate Marquardt in what we don't know in terms of Belfort's uh, tenure with the UFC, if he will continue to fight. I mean, Vitor had come out stating this is the last fight on his deal. The UFC says otherwise. Uh, But here he is, Vitor Belfort on the MMA Report. One of the standout fights on the card, it's a middleweight contest as Nate Marquardt will be taking on the man who joins us now, Vitor Belfort, who will be walking into a UFC octagon for the 25th time in his career. Vitor, how are you doing today? I'm doing fantastic, my friend. Thank you for asking. This is fight number 25 for you inside of the UFC. You have had one of the most uh, storied careers of any UFC fighter. Um, Is this something... um, 
Is this something that you're able to take in? I mean, there are very few fighters in history that can say they have fought 25 times for the UFC. <laughs> yeah, man, it's a, that showed how much love and, and, and respect we have for each other in these organizations. So since I fought with Bob Myovic, with with the Fertitas brothers, with Dana White, and now with IMG and still Dana White, I'm very thankful, and um, I just have everything to thank these guys to help build the sport, especially to Dana. It's been until today, you know, sacrifice. I believe he sacrificed his family a lot for for the sports. You know, he, he missed a lot of birthdays, you know, a lot of things, a lot of special moments, and I'm thankful. I'm very thankful for every for everything that he he went through it and. The sport is here, and, and I believe we have still a lot to grow. And as if you can ask Dana, you know, he he still understand that we have so much territory to we, we still have to gain, you know. And and I think I really believe you guys are gonna see, you know, you see it in, in biggest platform worldwide. And today you see already, but it's not even close to where it's gonna be in the sports. I really do believe. As we speak today, Vitor, are you approaching Saturday's fight as though it is definitely your final fight with the UFC, or is there the opportunity that this might not be it for you? Yeah, you know, we take one fight at a time. I, 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 I really, I, I feel like I rebirthed something in me. So we see, you know, I can see the future. I'm still with UFC, you know, I can see myself working with them. You know, not just as, as a fighter, but as as an executive, I see a lot of opportunity out there. Who knows? You know, we can create the legend league. You know, things can come up. You know, they can come up with a fight between. I heard the chess wants to come back. Maybe they can they can make this fight happen. They can start with the legend league with that fight. A lot of things can happen. You know, you gotta understand. You know, we we gotta take one fight at a time. So I see myself with this organization for a long time, and and I want to continue to help build, you know, the sport inside this organization, and I'm, I'm very thankful for them, you know, so. The last time we saw you fight, it was against Kelvin Gastelum, and I haven't heard your reaction when you found out um, about Kelvin Gastelum. He had marijuana metabolites in his system. The fight was changed to a no contest. Uh, how did you react to this news when, when you found out? Uh, you know, I, I don't like to talk about people, you know, you have to do what you have to do. I'm not here to point fingers to anyone. I just want to focus on, on my career and, and my legacy and, and whatever I have to do. So uh, that's my focus. Were there a number of fights offered to you for this card? Obviously, you fighting in Brazil is a huge deal. Nate Marquardt is the fight on Saturday. Uh, but uh, were there a lot of discussions about who your opponent would be in Rio de Janeiro? Yeah, you know, Nate is one of the, the veterans of the sport, so I'm looking for, for a great night of competition with him. You ha- have a unique role in the history of the UFC because, as you mentioned, you fought when it was Semaphore Entertainment, you fought while it was Zufa, and now you're fighting under a new ownership. Have you sensed a, a, a shift or a change at all in the structure of the UFC over the past year since this sale? You know, it's it's. Uh, I never had a chance to sit down with with Emmanuel, but I, I see their. I see that they're they're doing, the, a lot of changes, and I and I and I think changes are important. You know, changes are very important to, to happen, and and some changes will please some people. Some change will will, will displease some people, but, in the end of the day. You have to change, you know. You cannot remain the same. Things will never be the same. You, if you look business, you see Uber came Lyfter, you know, Lyft. You know, if you see Facebook came the the other one, the uh, no the Instagram, and they bought it, and they came the, the the other one, the Snapchat, and and they didn't couldn't buy it, and they're taking a lot of ground on them. So. In business, if you if you don't if, if you don't sacrifice what you have now to to do something different, you're gonna you're gonna lose it. You know your 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 competitor can take an edge in you. So it's all about growing and changing. And and and, and so I really believe 
I have the knowledge in business and, and my ideas are, uh, I don't say it's great, but it's, I think I have, uh, I have the will and I have the love for this organization that I have to build inside Octagon. And, and I believe I will be able to, to work with them, especially between the gap between the fighters and the organization to make, make it work changes, you know, who knows, creating the Legend League can be something else. And in the beginning can be something, you know, oh, this not gonna, but, you know, I see a big future in this. I, I see a lot of big future uh, and a lot of things that I have in mind. I, I believe you could sit down one day and, and sit down with them. I think they, some they're going to like it, some they don't like it, but in the other day, companies need people with, with dreamers, people that take risks, you know, that's the only way to succeed. You know, if you see Mark Zuckerberg, he had a chance to sell his company a long time ago, and, and everybody said, sell, sell, sell. He said, don't. I'm not going to sell. Everybody left and became Facebook, you know. Sometimes a visionary, you know, entrepreneur, you got to take some risk. That's the only way to, to go to the next level. It seems it's, that's something you've given a lot of thought to, what your contributions to the sport will be beyond fighting. And it, it sounds like you want kind of that role where you can be almost a liaison between the fighters and the executives and kind of, you know, voicing the, the thoughts of, of the fighters to, to those that are running the promotion. Because, you know, I, I talk to fighters. I see fighters, you know, speaking out. Mm-hmm. I think we're coming to a point that, People talking about union, union. I, I don't think we need any any more organization between. We don't need to anybody. I, I, the, the best way to make a company healthy and success is, is don't have no between. You know, so we when you have a middleman, you spend more money, you create a problem. So I think what we need we need someone that understands the fighting, the fighters, and, and can bring a concept between can be the middleman to bring. A, a, a better result, you know, for both. I think is is we have everything now in our favor to make the UFC one of the greatest sports in the world and worldwide. So it, it's just I think we need we just, we just just start doing things, you know, start trying things, you know. And I know that sounds like oh. Uh, it's, it's it's hard. It's easy. Oh, it's going to be impossible. No, it's possible. I can see that happen. I have four things. If I, if I can make the organization do it, that that will make a big difference in the lives in the pocket of fighters, and even the UFC will bring revenue. And and I think it's time. It's time for, you know, I know Roger Federer. You know, he's one of the leaders of this, this players. So he talked to the owners. And, and, and IMG is one of the owners of Wimbledon. So they understand that, that a lot. You know, they're great in business. They're great lawyers. They're great in entertaining. But we, we have to make sure UFC not just become entertaining. You know, it can become a sport in just like tennis, like NBA. And they, they already are, don't they get me wrong. But I see, I see the, the gap between the fighters and, and the organization. It's a thing that can be solved in a bit. You know what I mean? It's just, you just need someone out there working and, and making sure both parties are, are evolving and growing and, 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 and prospering. And I think it's not, it doesn't take a genius, but take someone with knowledge and, and experience to make it happen. The, the, all excellent points I think that you raised, Vitor, and, and many fighters would agree with you. Uh, we look forward to this fight. It's happening Saturday night. Vitor Belfort meets Nate Marquardt, part of UFC 212, 10 p.m. Eastern time on pay-per-view. It should be a fantastic atmosphere uh, for Vitor, and we look forward to whatever your next move is after this fight, and all the best going into Saturday night. Vitor, I appreciate this time. Thank, thank you very much, my friend. Thank you to Vitor Belfort for joining us. And now we'll take a quick look at UFC 212 before we wrap up the show. Uh, very interesting card. Tons of interest uh, for the main event. But on the undercard, uh, the Fight Pass portion will kick off at 6.30 Eastern time. On the Fight Pass portion, you've got uh, undefeated Davison Alcantara taking on Marco Beltran. Jim Wallhead takes on Luan Chagas. And Jamie Moyle taking on Vivian Pereira, who is victorious over Valerie Letourneau back in Toronto at UFC 206. Vivian Pereira 12-0 coming into this fight with Moyle at 115 pounds. 
Televised prelims at 8 Eastern. They will be airing on TSN 5 in Canada, FS1 in the U.S. Yuri Alcantara takes on Brian Kelleher. Johnny Eduardo against Matthew Lopez. That should be a very intriguing fight. Antonio Carlos Jr. takes on Eric Spicely. And then Rafael Sunsau take on Marlon Marias. Tons of interest in this featured prelim. Marias, the one and only World Series of Fighting bantamweight champion, uh, 11-0 during his World Series campaign. And and last fought in uh, December 31st. It was New Year's Eve at the theater at Madison Square Garden, beating Jose Naldo Silva uh, in that particular fight, fought three times in 2016, making his UFC debut. And what a test he has against the Sun Sao, one of the best bantamweights in the UFC. Uh, Marias has a chance to make a big splash in his debut uh, if he can defeat a Sun Sao. Pay-per-view will kick off with Eric Silva taking on Yancy Medeiros. Uh, this is an interesting one. Silva, certainly inconsistency has been... The consistency for Eric Silva dating back to his UFC debut in 2011, seven and six while fighting for the organization and defeated Luan Chagas by submission in his last fight, which was back in September. Uh, Yancy Medeiros is someone that um, he's coming off a submission win over Sean Spencer. That was back at 203 last September. So a while since we've seen Medeiros inside of a UFC octagon. Prior to that, he had dropped a decision to Francisco Trinaldo. I've always felt Yancy Medeiros, he is a fighter that has a ton of potential. I don't think we've always seen it from him. And maybe you could say the same with Eric Silva, that we see glimpses of it, but then he'll have a fight like he did against Nordin Taleb, where you're constantly reeling in your expectation on Eric Silva. I actually like Yancy Medeiros in this particular fight, and should be an entertaining one to open up the card at 170 pounds. Then Olawale Bamboche will be taking on Paulo Boracina, who is 9-0, made his UFC debut against Gareth McClellan. All of his wins, all nine of them, first round stoppages. Uh, so this is certainly uh, the most significant test uh, that Boracina has had here fighting at 185 pounds against Bamboche. Vitor Belfort, our guest earlier, will be taking on Nate Marquardt. With Vitor Belfort, uh, to this day, at 40 years of age, you know how how significant the first three to four minutes of a Vitor Belfort fight are. In this one, I do believe Vitor Belfort will be able to stop Nate Marquardt. I think he comes into this against an opponent that is, I think, not tailor-made for his style, but one in which uh, Belfort will be able to have the opportunity to land those significant strikes early. And I think that his power is such that he still can stop someone the level of a Nate Marquardt. I think the crowd is going to be unglued for this fight uh, with Vitor Belfort coming in. And then the big questions are what happens with Vitor after? I mean, the UFC maintains he has another fight left on his deal. Will he just fulfill that deal? And then it's an exit strategy to Bellator. Clearly in my interview, It sounds that he wants to keep all options open, even if it's a non-fighting role with the UFC. Would that position exist? Um, That's a big question, but it seems that there's going to be many questions for Vitor Belfort, win or lose, after this fight. Claudia Gedelia meets Karolina Kovalkiewicz at 115 pounds, two of the best strawweights in the division, both uh, with multiple losses uh, to Joanna Young. Dredchak, if you're considering Gedelia's two losses, and then Kovalkiewicz, who is coming off that loss to Joanna back in November at UFC 205. In this fight, I think it certainly favors Gedelia. She's a big favorite coming into this fight, which I don't look at her as a sizable favorite, but she is the fighter I favor in this one. The fact that it's three rounds, you go back to uh, International Fight Week last year where Gedelia looked very good against Joanna during the first two rounds of that fight. I think in this one, her striking will be uh, put to the test here against a very competent, very skilled striker in Kovalkiewicz, but I give Gedelia that edge uh, in particular. If you are going to criticize Gedelia, it's how she can fade later in rounds. This is not a championship fight, so that certainly plays to her advantage in this one. Uh, Gedelia, not to say a win necessarily is going to set up yet another Another fight with Joanna Yandrzejczyk, but I think this is one where um, both of these women are in a difficult position, having losses to the reigning champion. Uh, this is kind of you're viewing this fight in a vacuum. It's a very entertaining fight involving two of the best at 115 pounds, but my pick is Gedelia. And then the main event pits Jose Aldo against Max Holloway. This is a fantastic fight. If you were to take 
this scenario and apply it to a different weight class where the champion of the division leaves said division and an interim title is created and then he becomes the regular champion with another interim championship introduced for Max Holloway to win. I mean, I think that there would be such a cloud over a fight like that where it's not viewed as the best in the division. I don't think that applies to this fight. I think everyone looks at what Jose Aldo has done, the tear that Max Holloway has been on winning 10 straight, and the fact that no one expects Conor McGregor to return to 145 pounds at least any time soon. And I would be stunned if we do ever see him fight at featherweight again. I mean, his his future in MMA is very much in question. So I look at this as the two best active featherweights and the two best, fe- best featherweights the UFC currently has at that weight class. I don't think there's any dispute on that. And that's why so many people are into this fight. Jose Aldo... Yes, you can hold the Conor McGregor loss against him, but you have to equally weigh how great he came back and overcame that devastating loss to perform in the way in which he did against Frankie Edgar to win that interim title last July at UFC 200. Jose Aldo certainly will take strikes. He did in the Frankie Edgar fight, but he's also someone that still has that speed, still has that ability to get out of the way of shots, to measure his counters. And of course, his leg kicks, which are his bread and butter. And that, to me, it will be a big factor in this fight. Max Holloway is someone that will come forward, certainly has... Uh, he, he is a very lengthy fighter, but it is Jose Aldo that has the one inch reach advantage in this fight that when you visually uh, think of these two fighters, you don't assume Jose Aldo has the length in terms of reach. But I feel that this fight is one where Max Holloway will press forward, and I think that could put him in a lot of danger. Jose Aldo is fine to play a counter game all night long and allow Max Holloway to make mistakes. The issue is Max Holloway doesn't make a whole lot of mistakes during this run. You have seen him uh, go through the who's who of the featherweight class. Ricardo Lamas, Cub Swanson, Anthony Pettis. I mean, these have been superlative performances for Max Holloway. This is one... This very well could go the distance. Jose Aldo has that patience. He can also tire late in fights. Uh, Max Holloway, we have yet to see him go five full rounds. Um, and that, that's new territory for Holloway in this particular fight. I, I love this fight. I'm picking Jose Aldo. The guy still only 30 years of age. He's put on a lot of miles because of the way in which Novo Nyao trains and prepares, but I have not seen Aldo. I mean, we brought up the Chad Mendes fight earlier in the program, but I don't think he's had those, those wars in front of our eyes that would make you feel that he's a significant step slower than past years. I think Jose Aldo is someone that can still keep going at this top level uh, for a number of years. And when he feels his speed is diminishing, there is the option at 155 that he's always kind of teased going to at some point in his career. So I'm going with Jose Aldo. I have a really hard time picking against him. Max Holloway is an unbelievable fight. This is a huge test for both guys uh, in this fight, and I think it could be an excellent fight come Saturday night and should be electric at the HSBC Arena in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. That's going to wrap it up. Next week on the show, we will look at all of UFC 212 and the big winners and losers coming out of that card. And then the UFC, they are embarking on an insane schedule over the next two months, and they are going to transition from UFC 212 and then immediately uh, look towards Auckland, New Zealand, where they will be the following weekend with Derek Lewis taking on Mark Hunt, and they will have cards every single weekend in June with uh, Singapore the weekend after that, which is headlined by Holly Holm and Betch Kohea, and then they round out the month of June in Oklahoma City as Michael Chiesa takes on Kevin Lee, a fight that has certainly uh, gained in interest and momentum after the Dallas press conference. So lots of big fights coming up in June for the UFC. And that final weekend in June is going to feature Bellator's return to pay-per-view as well. So a big weekend to close out the month of June. That is all for me. I want to thank Vitor Belfort and Cody Safdick for joining me. You can follow me on Twitter at I am John Pollock. Subscribe to the MMA Report with John Pollock on iTunes. You can also get the show through Live Audio Wrestling at both iTunes and LiveAudioWrestling.com, and we'll speak with you next week. 